Hi, I'm Lee Moreland, and I'd like to talk to you today about the St. John's Cathedral Library. Most of us are familiar with that beautiful space. Maybe we gather there between services on Sunday or for meetings during the week. But you may not know about the library itself. There are literally thousands of items in our collection, and they're not just books about religion. They're books about any topic. At the end of this video, we'll share a link to our online card catalog, and I'd encourage you to check it out. I think you'll be very impressed with what the Cathedral Library has. This week, we're continuing to examine the best books in our collection, and those are books by local authors. And this week's author has written two books, one called Last Days, and the second is called America the Beautiful. And that's Robert Pollack. Robert, these are both great books. Thank you for doing this. Well, I appreciate you having me here, and I look forward to talking about it, and I'm glad it's going to be in the library. Great. People Excellent. People can grab it. There you go. Get out. <laughs> there you go. Let's start with the first book, Last sure. Days. Bob, this is a great book. It was a powerful book, and I enjoyed reading it. It's also a Knoxville book. People yes. that read this will recognize St. John's Cathedral. The family here lives in Forth and Gill. They read the New Sentinel. They work downtown. Yeah. This is very yeah. much a Knoxville book. Yeah. But it's also about a family that's going through a real crisis. Mm -hmm. Tell sure me about is. your decision to write this book. Well, it's a little bit, you know, in all, almost all novels in particular, there's a little bit autobiography in everything. And so it's hard to keep your personal, one, one of them, the people that know me uh, read the book and they said, your father's in that book. I said, I know, I know it's hard to keep them out. Uh, but I started to write the book because the journey that families take when they uh, have a, a family member in, out with Alzheimer's or with some other terminal illness, uh, it's, it's very difficult and everybody has their own little perspective and their own little life that they're trying to weave together. And I said, you know, I'd like to give something because there's a lot of people you feel very isolated, very lonely, very um, much by yourself sometimes when, when you're going through this. And I thought, well, you know, I'll write this story and then people who are, are on this journey can realize and maybe come to see that they're not alone, not at all. So I said, you know, let me sort of compile some anecdotes from my history and history that I've heard from other people. And uh, I remember my grandfather who, uh, he was the rock. Mm -hmm. But in his older years, he came down with Alzheimer's and he was not the shell of a person. He became a different person, literally. And uh, I remember he used to have some conversations with, you know, they have lucid periods from time to time. And in his lucid periods, sometimes he would tell me what's going on inside. And I said, you know, most people don't realize what's going on, what these people struggle through themselves. So I said, let me light, write it. And to be honest with you, I never expected it to be any kind of commercial success. It was more or less uh, a catharsis on my part and, and the hope that somebody who reads that, and I said it in Knoxville because I was familiar with Knoxville and I thought it a great, a great place to have this story told. It's a, it's a great book. Um, it's an emotional book. Yes. There's a sadness to it. There's a, a reality to what the family is going through. Yeah. But I think it's also a hopeful book. Yeah. Um, and it's a good balance between those two things, I think. Right. Lots of people go through that issue, other health scares, other crises. Yeah. What would you hope people would take away from this book? The main, the main um, theme uh, throughout this book is that at the end of the day, in those last days, the peace that emerges is the family peace, the love, that's what helps you survive. We all have our own issues. I mean, life is, uh, uh, there's, there's unpleasantness and, and 
dark moments in every single life. That's not what it's about. What it's about is how love and those enduring um, relationships that you build over a lifetime, how they see you through a dark period like this. And uh, there's some humor in there because the people do funny stuff. But uh, that's just to kind of lighten the mood from time to time. But I really want people to understand that it is the personal relationships and love that you build it in over the length of your life. I mean, this family started from when they were youngsters, mm -hmm. and now they're adults wrestling with this. And it's, it's that, it was that love and values and family that persisted, that prevailed, and that at the end of the day, that is what will prevail. It's a great message. It is a very good book. And the second book is a great book too, America the Beautiful. And this book is, it begins with a history lesson. Yeah. And then it highlights the uh, experiences of immigrants from all over the world who come to the United yeah. States. And it's their successes and their failures and their struggles. Um, how did you select the people to go into this book? Lee, this is the strangest book I've ever tackled. Um, it didn't even start as a book. It started as an experience. Um, and I think to give a little perspective of that, what I tried to get at, it occurred, uh, I was in um, uh, Orlando. And if, if any of you folks at home have been to Orlando and um, you, you will find that somebody somewhere is going to wrestle you into a timeshare <laughs> presentation. And that's what happened to me. And so I go to this thing, and I, I had no, uh, no chance I was going to buy this thing. Uh, they told, I had a timeshare already that I was trying to get rid of. But uh, anyway, I wound up there, and when they realized I wasn't going to buy one. They sat me down. You have to see the, uh, I guess it's the uh, head salesperson or the uh, manager. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of give you your exit and you get your Disney World ticket or whatever they're giving you. And this dark-skinned man in his, probably I guess his 40s, comes out and sits down. Terrific guy, very personable guy as you might imagine. And when he realized, you know, I probably wasn't going to buy, we just started having a conversation. And I just, all I said to him was, you know, it's interesting, where are you from and, you know, what's it been like for you here? Well, Lee, he tells me this fantastic story of how he came as a young Muslim boy. He tells me about his home and, you know, they lived in literally uh, almost a, a mud house mm -hmm. in Morocco. Uh, in, in extreme poverty, and he has this dream to come to the United States. And he gets here, no English, no nothing. And he gets a job, well, <laughs> first he gets a job at Wendy's, but ultimately he's working at a hotel. And he's a busboy, and he doesn't speak any English, so he can't survive. But he's getting along, he's making a little bit of money. And the long and short of it is, throughout his entire conversation, he's telling me how great a country this is and how wonderful it is to be here and all the things that have happened to him that have been terrific. So I'm sitting there listening to this fabulous story and I'm, I'm feeling good about my car, I'm feeling good about me. You know, I said, well, this is great, you know. Well. I leave the, the meeting and everything, and, but I, it, it sort of stuck with me over the course of the day. Sure. Well, I go to dinner that night with my daughter at, a, at this steakhouse, and this fellow comes over, and you know, Orlando has a terrific number of immigrants in it, mm -hmm. so it's not unusual to run into them. I'm sure. uh, sitting at dinner, and this fellow comes over, and he's got somewhat of an accent, and, and so just, I don't know why, I just said, well, I said, I notice you have a little bit of an accent. Uh, what do you call home? Lebanon. I said, oh, I said, yeah, how long have you been here? He said, 40 years. And I said, wow, that's great. How's it going for you? Without further prompting, he, he looks over and he touches, he says, greatest country in the world. Oh, wow. And don't let nobody tell you other. Look at me. 
Four years I'm here, look, I'm running this place. I'm making great money, I'm loving it. I, like, I'm in shock, you know? Gee, that's interesting. So over the course of my week there, I, every, if somebody had an accent, I'd say, tell me a little bit about your story. Why are you here? And mm -hmm. it was story after story after story telling me how great America was. Gosh. So I said, I never thought about this. That this and so on the way home, I'm thinking to myself, Bob, there's, these stories can't sit in the dark like this. These this is stuff that people need to realize, because I certainly didn't realize the depth of feeling. You know, I, to be honest with you, I thought people came here, just struggled, tried to make do. And, and uh, no, that wasn't it. And so I started to think about it, and I said, well, let me, let me see. Maybe there is a book here somewhere, somewhere. You know, my dad used to say is, <laughs> I would be telling him about something, something great, and he'd He'd cut me short and he'd say, is there a pony under this rubble somewhere? <laughs> well, there was a pony under all that rubble somewhere. And, and uh, so I sat down and I said, well, let me just talk to people. And at first, I really wasn't interviewing them for a book. I was just more sure. get a feeling of it. Yeah. Well, uh, and of course, not thinking ahead, there were things that I wish I had asked some of these people that I didn't. But then I said, well, I'm, I've got to put a head on this. So I started writing. Mm -hmm. And it took me literally months to come up with the format that I use on this. Because you can't just tell one biography after another, sure. after another, after another. People will be sticking pencils in their eyes uh, with boredom. But, so you had to have a certain theme mm -hmm. uh, and a certain approach. So. You'll notice that every chapter in the book has the word America in it. You know, it's uh, becoming America, coming to America, journeys in America. You know, why did they come? What happened after they got here? What were the hurdles that they had to surmount? What kinds of lessons did they learn along the way? Uh, and then my last chapter is a defense of this great country and, and what we have and what we've built, because there are people right now, quite frankly, who would be happy to throw the founders and the founding documents into the trash heap. Mm -hmm. and, and we better be careful because there are things here and these immigrants tell us why. There are great things about this country that we cannot afford to just dismiss because we've got something new. Uh, so that was really the, what, what brought the book about and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a message of hope. That's what I really wanted people to have when they read this book. It's a message of hope and opportunity and, and the way these people persevered through stuff and surmounted just unbelievable hurdles. Um, just by way of example, Lee, I know I'm running on, probably got other questions, but there's a woman in here from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this one, her name is Shigitu Kabidi. She comes here, she, she left Ethiopia as a pregnant teen, walking by night, barefoot, with her brother, to escape the, the guard and the army mm -hmm. in Ethiopia, because she knew if they, they got her, she'd go to jail and her brother would be in the army. She walks by night and hides, winds up in Kenya, after being arrested and raped and all kinds of things happening to her. It takes her two and a half years of being in Kenya. The UN puts her on a refugee list and you don't get choices. They just put you on a plane and take you somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where does this woman wind up? The blackest woman you'll ever meet, believe me. Where does she wind up? North Dakota. As she put it, the whitest white place on the planet Earth is where she winds up not speaking English, knowing nothing about it. And she said she was terrified because with all the snow, where would she grow her food? How would she survive? And it's a wonderful story of how people came to her aid and, and helped her along the way and saw to it that she didn't slip through the cracks. And it was a church thing at first, but there was a lot of others along the way. She has the greatest story to tell about how 
She just saw little opportunities and took them. Mm -hmm. Just took advantage, little pieces at a time. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that no matter what your circumstances are when you get to America, no matter what people might think of you, there is hope, there is prosperity waiting, but you just have to make the effort yourself and move along the way and you will survive it. You will end up prospering. Now, not everybody in there is prosperous and wealthy. Matter of fact, most of them aren't. But they live good, worthwhile lives and they're happy and they love the country. And Lee, you want to know what they told me? You know, people always say, well, what was the one message they have? What is it they really like about the country? What is that thing? Well, I'll save everybody the time that you won't even have to read it. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> Liberty and freedom and economic mobility. See, we're not constrained. Nobody is constrained by... Uh, today's circumstances or your past history even, or the low expectations of others. Um, I spent my life exceeding the expectations of other people. Uh, and, and it's a very, very happy thing. I got a letter when I applied to uh, Northwestern once in my idiotic years. I thought I'd go to Northwestern. <laughs> think, think that over <laughs> a little bit. And they sent me a letter and they said that I in no way met their academic standards and I should apply to schools with less rigorous standards. <laughs> and when I left Indiana University uh, two years later with a 3.9, I took my transcript and mailed it to that person <laughs> and said, obviously you made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I never heard from them. <laughs> but the point being, all of these individuals had low expectations from other people, mm -hmm. and it didn't constrain them. So, you know, you're mostly limited. Most of the limitations we have in life, we put there ourselves. We true. put there ourselves. I mean, sure, there's, there's barriers. Everybody has to go through some hardship, but, but the limitations that, uh, the, the worst limitation you can have is the one you put on yourself. You know, people talk about oppression. There's the worst kind of oppression, self-oppression. Oh, I can't do that because, oh, you know, nothing ever comes my way, or I never get a break, or I, no, no. Uh, it's, 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 it's not as black and white and simple as that. And that's what that book gets at. These people just persevered. Persevered and, and, and didn't take no for an answer. That Moroccan guy, <laughs> I have it in the book. I don't know what people thought of him. He never took no for an answer. No matter what they told him he couldn't do, he'd go do it anyway. It's a very inspiring book. I think it's a good reminder, those of us who were fortunate enough to be born in this country, take things for granted. Yeah. And this is a good reminder about yeah. our country. It's a good tribute to our country. So... We see we live in an uncertain world. We see the situation mm -hmm. in Ukraine, people mm -hmm. yeah. being forced from their homes. Still, people want to come to this country. What should people know about America? What they need to understand about there's two, two central things that they need to know about America. And one of those things is that just arriving, getting your feet on the soil in America is not the end of their story. Mm -hmm. uh, opportunities and, and uh, moving forward doesn't happen unless they do something. Now that isn't just immigrants, that's all of us. We, if, if, if we're waiting for great things to happen, well, we're gonna wait for a while because you know, unless you happen to pick the winning lottery ticket, which most of us don't, and I got a dead ticket right here in my <laughs> pocket that, Another 120 million short this week. Uh, you don't go forward until you move yourself forward. So whether it means a little more education or learning a trade or learning something uh, or, or just you have to take advantage. Look for opportunities and, and take advantage of them. Um, and um, when you come to, when these people come to America, they have to understand, and most of them do, by the way. Mm -hmm. Most of them realize that just getting here is not the issue. It's mm -hmm. what we do after we get here. And, and uh, 
the other thing is there isn't a cap on where you can go. I mean, we, I, I'm, I'm 78 years old. I don't know if I've hit the, the, the apex yet. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Of course, my son says uh, after he sees, you know, that I can't operate the closed caption on a TV, he says, Dad, just sit back. Let, let other people <laughs> handle it. But, but you know, it, uh, and, and the other great thing about America is this, that in America, people are here to help you. You know, we, we talk about, um, and you hear an awful lot about racism and, and uh, acrimonious dissent between different groups, you know, white people against black people or minority people, uh, the prosperous against folks that aren't so prosperous, men against women, you know. And, and I, I, I hate that. And I say in the book, that's one thing. We, we need to reject that philosophy. And uh, one person that's in there, I asked him about it, and he said, I've 40 years here, and I've not been ever discriminated against. He says there's been people that have had bad opinions. Mm -hmm. But if they'd sit down with me for 10, min 10 minutes, they'll come away with a different opinion, and I'll come away with a new friend. And I don't know if you know him, but do you know uh, Yassine, yes, the falafel absolutely. house? Yassine Taru, he's right down the street here. Oh, his story's in there. What a marvelous uh, person he is. Yeah. He just uh, exudes confidence. He's overcome so many hurdles. Yeah. But even he says, you know, yeah, there's, not every day is sunshine. Some days aren't so great. Sure. But... Uh, he found people to be, you know, his, they tried to burn his store out. Right. And he said the thing that astounded him was that people came out of the woodwork to help him put stuff back together and, and provide support or money or whatever it took yeah. to get the. Yes, there was a, an idiot, um, a, probably a prejudiced idiot, who did something that's uh, remarkably bad. Yeah. Uh, but the overwhelming support more than counterbalanced his actions. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a, a story that's got to get told because Americans are very outgoing and they're very caring. You know, Jerry today in his, in his uh, sermon talked about a poor fellow, a homosexual, comes feeling completely isolated, comes in, and now all of a sudden people are making them feel worthwhile and extending. That's America. That's the America I know. That's the America most Americans know. And so I think that if you read that book, that'll be a message that uh, I think ultimately will come through to you. The, the greatness of America is the people that are in America. Yes, we have great resources and things like that, but it's the people that make America great. It's a great message. Both of these books by Robert Pollack are excellent books and they're in our library. And later on in the month, we'll have an opportunity for a book signing and to learn more about both of these books. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you. It was great being here. Thank everybody for watching. And um, I hope if you read my book and you come by the church, I'll bring my little pen and I'll sign it for you. There you go. <laughs> thank no you. No extra charge. <laughs> Thank you.